Cybernetics is, um, okay, first of all, the preamble to this topic is that when I tell you what cybernetics is, it's going to be like when I told you what reflexivity is. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel silly explaining what reflexivity is because um, it goes something like this. I, it feels like I'm explaining something that um, everybody already knows about. Like it's common sense, right? So cybernetics is like that. Cybernetics is basically any system, including each of us, we are systems, anything that has an intention and so acts on that intention and somehow it didn't turn out the way in, it was intended, so the next time you do it, you change what you do, right? Well, the appropriate response to that is, well, duh, what planet were you born on? Yeah, right? The baby hits its head on the table. From then on, the baby avoids sharp corners forever. What's the last time you bumped your head on the sharp corner of a table? Ignoring the fact that you're taller now, but there's still lots of things you can bump into. But we don't bump into sharp corners anymore because we did it already. We don't need to learn that lesson anymore. It, it, it's, it's one definition of insanity. Well, actually, it's Einstein's definition of insanity, right? It's quoted all the time in political campaigns. The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, right? Reflexivity in the presidential campaign. Um, so what is this? Oh, it says, this is a governor. So the root, word, the root Latin words for uh, cybernetics is the same as governor. Governor, cybernetic means governor. Governor means cybernetic. The government is intended to be a, <coughs> uh, a cybernetic system. It's a means of control. You design the outcome, and then you change what you do to until you achieve that outcome. It's that simple. Do you know how a governor works? Who knows how? A yes, Adam. Uh, And how does it do that? Yeah. Well, this is the original one from 1860 something, 1868. The faster this spins, the further out these two weights go. And what do you know about a pendulum? Does it matter how heavy the pendulum is? No, it matters the length of the arm. A pendulum, no matter what weight you put on it, it will swing at the same rate uh, because the energy on one side, it's the period of the swing is, <coughs> anyway, try it. You learn this in third grade, you don't remember it, fifth grade, right? You learn this in fifth grade, who, who knew that it was, it's okay if you forget it. You didn't know it was going to be useful here in 14th grade. 15th, 16th grade, right? Um, so you forgot it. That's okay. But it's useful. The, f the faster it spins, the further out these weights go, and it takes more energy to get it to spin. So it naturally governs the rate of spinning. So when it, when it spins slower, the arms drop down because of centrifugal force like a skater. Don't make me spin. Um, and... Uh, so it naturally uses physical principles to maintain a steady rate of spin. It's an automatic regulator. When the arms go out, uh, the valve closes. If it spins too fast, the valves will close. If it spins too slow, the valves will, will open, and it'll maintain a balance. So have you ever opened a toilet tank? Have you ever had to fix the toilet? 
Have you ever, has the toilet ever just kind of just keep running, right? So this is the basic diagram of a cybernetic system. This is a system without the feedback loop where there's an input, the system does something, and there's an output. And you can, um, you can make a strawberry rhubarb pie and leave out the strawberries, and it, it's really kind of bitter and sour, right? And you can do that over and over again the same way, and it will always be bitter and sour. But if you taste it, if you make a strawberry rhubarb pie and you taste it after you made it, you say, ah, what's that? Then you say, ah, I forgot the strawberries. That's the feedback loop. The next time you do it, add the strawberries, dummy, right? So it's a cybernetic system. Again, why do we have to go to college and pay good money to learn about this, right? Why do you have to make up a big fancy pants word like cybernetics for something that I knew this when I was three years old. I don't know about you, I knew about this when I was three. Did you? You did. And then we make it, you know, this I get. And the strawberry rhubarb pie, I get that. So why do you have to draw it like this? We draw it like this because engineers like to abstract things. This is the way engineers draw it. You wouldn't try going on the internet and find uh, a, a diagram of a feedback loop. You'd be amazed at the gibberish that's out there. This is the simplest possible schematic diagram of a feedback loop. Too many people spent too many hours in electronics engineering. Anyway, this is basically um, a schematic electronic system diagram of the strawberry rhubarb pie. And uh, if you ever study engineering, they will talk about feedback loops as one of the most essential parts of any engineered system, whether it's electronics, mechanical, uh, operations research, management, uh, all kinds of systems. This is one of the most fundamental aspects of any system. And here's an example that we know very familiar, we're very familiar with it. Without the thermostat, without the feedback loop of the thermostat, uh, you might as well just set it to 60 and leave. Oh, wait, that's what we do all the time. Not the brightest thing to do. Uh, we could come in here and it'll be 60 degrees. That's why. Um, so the thermostat, this is just the most familiar thing for us of how a feedback loop works. The toilet tank. The first clock ever invented was also the first cybernetic system. If a tank of water is at the same level all the time, the flow rate of that water will be absolutely consistent, allowing you to make a clock. But how do you keep that tank filled at exactly the same level all the time? You create a cybernetic feedback loop. If the water level drops too low, the float drops, the valve opens, it fills up with water. Uh, if the tank gets too full, the float rises, it stops the valve, and it, it comes back to that level, a preset level. Um, you can do it. This is kind of how the first water clock worked, but we also know it as a toilet. Uh, it's a cybernetic system. Now, here's a confusing thing that not everyone gets. There is positive feedback. There is negative feedback. Negative sounds bad, right? And positive sounds good? Well, this is the hard part. Positive feedback is where you go up to the microphone and you say, tap, 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 is this thing on? And you move your mouth too close. And all of a sudden it goes, whoop! That's positive feedback. It's not a positive experience. It's a negative experience. But it's positive feedback. Why do we call that positive feedback? It's like when a nuclear chain reaction goes super critical. The hotter it gets, the more the reaction speeds up. The hotter it gets, the more the reaction speeds up. And all of a sudden, you have a nuclear meltdown. It, when something goes super critical, it's because it's a positive feedback loop. The more it goes, the worse it gets. You know how when you get behind on your homework? I don't have to tell you about this, about meltdown. 
right? The further you get behind, the more anxious you get. It's harder just to sleep. The further you get behind, the more anxious you get. That's positive feedback. It's a horrible experience, but it's positive feedback, right? Similarly, there's uh, a positive feedback that shuts down the system as well. Um, sometimes positive feedback is a good thing. Um, and um, maybe I'll add this to the end. Um, sometimes, I don't know if this works. But um, sometimes, and ne so, so negative feedback is where you, where this is negative feedback, where the worse it gets, what if the busier you got, the easier your homework got? So the big thing in studio happens, and so uh, the other teachers just say, class is canceled, just forget about class. And so you get to this nice equilibrium. Wouldn't that be nice? So this is negative feedback. Negative feedback is uh, the way we strike a balance. Negative feedback is um, the way water clocks worked, uh, where the more water came in, the less the valve is open. The less the water is in, the more the valve opens. So that's a negative feedback. It, cr it prevents systems from from driving out of control uh, and cr creates a balance. Uh, when you don't want the microphone to feed back, you put in a negative feedback loop in the circuitry to prevent feedback from happening. So um, Norbert, Nor what's his name? Norbert Wiener <coughs> was the uh, MIT mathematician who basically coined the term cybernetics. Well, Plato said it in terms of government. It's been with us. He kind of brought it back into engineering systems. So he's considered to be the father of cybernetics, um, Norbert Wiener. Um, we'll skip that. And Claude Shannon, also local resident, uh, uh, he made feedback loops. He, he fixed the mathematics of feedback loops that gave us digital systems. Um, here he is with the rat in the maze. Does this happen? So feedback loops. I'll put this in the movie. Um, you've heard of this guy? Who's this guy? Hendrix. You've heard of him. Why would we uh, refer to Hendrix and the feedback. I'll tell you later. <laughs> so, yeah, he took positive feedback that was a negative thing and he said, uh, cool, let's use it. Okay, so Cyber Cities. Um, the author of Cyber Cities is the person we will be reading between now and Tuesday, uh, Christine Boyer. She's an architectural historian, uh, theorist, who has brought cybernetics into the discussion of architecture and cities. Uh, it's a difficult reading. I strongly encourage you, when you go through, basically it's the provi profiles of these key figures in cybernetic thinking in architecture. Don't just read what she says. Also go to Wikipedia and read what it says in Wikipedia and between what she says and what Wikipedia says, you might be able to figure this out. Um, I'm going to bring up just one more idea. Uh, two more ideas. The first idea is that cybernetics, the biggest impact cybernetics has had is in business schools and organizational arrangements. That, uh, that there needs to be a strong feedback loop in order to keep organizations operating well. It's been transformative in the business world, and it accounts for a lot of the success of the last few decades. Um, the other thing I want to bring up 
is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Does anyone know what that is? No. That's Murphy's Law. Heisenberg? Anyone? Heisenberg uncertainty principle, they got really good at measuring whether a particle has a negative spin or a positive spin. They also got really good at identifying precisely where the location of that particle is. But a weird thing happened. Heisenberg noticed that if you measure where the particle is, you can't measure which direction the spin is. Uh, that information is gone. And if you measure the spin, you can't measure the position. So the act of measurement changes the behavior of the system. Also, and even more telling, this is the part you should remember. The way you test for spin is you ask the particle. There's a way of asking the particle. You say, particle, how you doing? Are you spinning negative? You can't say which way are you spinning, it won't answer. The only way you can ask the question is, are you spinning negative? The particle will say yes. And then you say, okay, partic next particle, are you spinning positive? The particle will say yes. No matter which way you ask the question, the particle says yes. Which is creepy in physics. If you're a scientist, this is a creepy moment. You say, particle, I'm out here, I'm the scientist, you, I'm studying you, don't be influenced, but pay no attention to me. Do what you're going to do, don't let me influence your answer. Okay, particle, are you spinning positive? Yes. Listen, particle, just ignore me. Don't, just, you know, so it's a problem. It turns out that you can't ask the question without changing the results, which throws all the presumptions of science out the window. All of a sudden, the scientist, the observer, is changing the thing that they're studying. So science cannot happen under those conditions. The whole point of science is you learn from the empirical reality that's happening. It's, it, it's ruined as soon as the scientist changes it. Now, one last point. Pierre Bourdieu, French anthropologist, big architecture, everyone loves, everyone who studies architecture in the advanced degrees loves Pierre Bourdieu, the anthropologist, because he's the one who said, listen, Heisenberg, it's not just particles. Science always changes the results of the thing it studies, especially anthropology. As soon as you ask the people in Kibera, Nairobi, how's it going? How are you feeling today? You change the results. Science always changes the results. So he's the one who's responsible for the word reflexive. He's the one who said scientific study is by its very nature reflexive. It always changes the thing it's studying. The scientist is always in the maze with the rat, changing what the rat is deciding. Um, and so that's what kind of triggered this whole interest in the 20th century with this idea of reflexivity. It's his fault. But it started with Heisenberg and particles. There's a very strong connection. So there we have it, cybernetics from Plato's government to all systems with feedback loops to Heisenberg uncertainty principle to reflexive sociology. Okay? Good luck with the reading. Is this, gonna be online? this will be online. <laughs>